This podcast is brought to you by Conquer Cancer, the ASCO Foundation, where our mission is to accelerate breakthroughs in life-saving research and empower people everywhere to conquer cancer. Welcome to Your Stories, a podcast where we hear candid stories from people conquering cancer. I'm Clifford Huddis, the Chief Executive Officer of the American Society of Clinical Oncology, or ASCO for short, and I also serve as Conquer Cancer's Executive Vice Chair. I'm also a medical oncologist with a specialty in treating patients with breast cancer. I am not, however, one of the official hosts of the Your Stories podcast, but because I have experience in the topics that we're talking about today, I'm happy to take the reins. And I'm excited to be joined today by Ms. Athena Jones, a CNN reporter and two-time breast cancer survivor, and my longtime friend and colleague, Dr. Judy Garber, a breast cancer oncologist also, who serves as scientific director for the Breast Cancer Research Foundation. Welcome, both of you, to your stories. Thanks, Cliff. Thank you, Cliff. Now, when you think of the color pink, whether it's pink ribbons or pink football cleats, it's pretty likely these days that breast cancer comes to mind. And that is hardly an accident. Over the last few decades, public awareness of breast cancer has been elevated significantly, culminating every October when people around the nation put on their pink attire to recognize Breast Cancer Awareness Month. But this rise in awareness did not happen overnight and it did not occur in a vacuum. And that is what we're going to talk about today. How? Did breast cancer gain such prominence in the public psyche? And what can we learn from the breast cancer movement that might help us across the field of oncology? So before we get started, I'm going to introduce again our guests and ask where everybody is joining us from today. I myself, I'm in the ASCO headquarters in Alexandria, Virginia, Athena. Hi, I'm, I'm in New York, uh, in Manhattan at my office. And Dr. Garber. I'm actually working from home today, so I'm in Newton, Massachusetts, just outside Boston. Great. Well, thank you again. Now, I'm going to start us off by diving right into the topic at hand, breast cancer. Athena, you were diagnosed and treated for breast cancer, and I'm sure you have poignant and challenging memories from that time. What did you find maybe most difficult? And at the same time, what was it that sustained you and gave you hope as you began that journey? Thanks for the question. You know, when I was first diagnosed, I was only 36 years old. I didn't have any breast cancer. No breast cancer runs in my family. I wasn't aware of any then. I'm not aware now. And I happened to have a doctor, this is when I lived in Washington, D.C., who believed in offering her patients baseline mammograms. I think she began offering it, them to her patients who were in their mid-30s. She offered it to me when I was 36. I said yes without even giving it another thought. And went ahead and did it. And that's when they discovered what they diagnosed as extensive ductal carcinoma in situ. Of course, there were scratches on the x-ray and I had to go and have biopsies and all that follow up. So very, very early stage cancer. But of course, I was advised, I was only 36, not in my family. I was advised to be aggressive and I wanted to be aggressive. The challenge for me at the time was that my own mother was sick and dying of a different cancer. Unfortunately for her, a much rarer form of cancer that doesn't get nearly as much attention. And so while I had great support from family, close family and friends, I kept it from my mother for the first couple of months because I knew she was being fed by a feeding tube. And I knew that she would want to come from Houston, where I'm from, to then DC at the time and be there for me throughout my surgery and all my recovery when she herself would have needed a nurse. And so I think one of the things that I didn't get to benefit from either time I, had, I was diagnosed, because the second time I also kept it pretty close to the chest because I wanted to focus on just getting better. And I worked throughout. At this time, it was invasive. That's when I was 39 when it came back. But I kept it kind of quiet until I was completely done. That's when I became an advocate. But I think that I didn't get to benefit then from, you know, breast cancer support groups and being around peers who were going through the exact same thing because I was keeping it so quiet to kind of protect that situation. Now I'm part of a breast cancer support group way after the fact, and I kind of realized everything I was missing out on. I think for the most part, there is so much available to folks like me who were diagnosed with breast cancer. And if I had had a slightly different circumstance, I would have 
been able to avail myself of all there is or more of what there is out there. So it's so interesting, even, you know, your singular personal experience almost immediately highlights a broad range of common experiences that are, I think, we see certainly across our years of treating patients with breast cancer and across the spectrum in terms of how individual patients and families respond. I can't help but almost editorialize it. At least my personal takeaway has always been there is no single right way for an individual to cope, and there's no right answer. But maybe I'll pivot to Dr. Garber, who I'm going to slip and call Judy from now on. You, of course, like me, have spent many, many years actually on the other side of the desk from patients like Athena. And I hesitate almost to ask about the physician perspective because a minor issue that we tend to gloss over is that a third to half of us are going to be patients anyway. It doesn't matter that we're also doctors. And so this dichotomy between the patient and the doctor, the older we get, I will just tell you, it fades away. Um, without getting too specific. But that said, what would you say your time treating patients with breast cancer, what did that teach you about the patient experience? And if it changed how you see the world and how you approach challenges, is there some high level takeaway for you in this? Well, I'm going to back up one little bit and just say my mother had breast cancer. And it was a long time ago because I was only in fifth grade. So this is roughly caveman days. But it was so different, Athena. I mean, you were quiet on your own. When my mother had breast cancer, people didn't talk about breast cancer. You know, she was in the era when you went to surgery and didn't know if you would wake up with a breast or not and go home with a sock in your bra. And it was the days when Reach to Recovery was just starting. Programs when women were just starting to say, this is not good enough. We need more. So I think Cliff and I both have grown up as breast oncologists in that period when women were beginning to speak out and say, we need to have different options. We need to do this in a different way. And yet, as Cliff says, every patient is different herself. And each woman's journey seems to be finding the support where she can, knowing whether she's someone who can talk about this or someone who has still not told her children that she went through chemotherapy. You know, there's a lot of range, but at least Today, we have a lot more support for that range. And for those people who want help, there is more help. And that's because women stood up and said, this has to change. So that's actually a perfect point, standing up and saying this has to change. You almost but not quite got back to the, if I remember correctly, Betty Ford era, Pat Nixon era, when out of the shadows came breast cancer to be discussed in public and openly. So uh, Athena, I mean, you obviously have tremendous experience in media getting people's attention. Thinking back to those decades, what do you think it is that you would highlight that the breast cancer community has done that has allowed for awareness to be raised so successfully? I think a lot of this has to do with being vocal. You guys have both touched on it. The fact of the matter is, it's because it's so common, one in eight women, I mean, that's a lot. That's a lot. I think that's part of the reason that you have so many potential spokespeople. I don't have enough historical awareness of kind of the evolution of the, at the early part of this movement, but I can certainly tell you that nowadays it feels like it's a weird way to put it, but it's like the most popular cancer. Like we hear about it the most. Everyone knows when Breast Cancer Awareness Month is. You see football players wearing pink shoes. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that people were, have over time been more willing to be vocal. But I also think it's because so many people have been touched by breast cancer. People have been touched by all kinds of cancer, but I think that people can relate to it. We're seeing, you know, people in the media like Robin Roberts, Amy Robach, those are uh, two anchors on, I don't know if Amy's still on ABC, but, you know, prominent anchors who kind of shared their journeys. I believe Katie Couric only in the last couple of years announced that she was going through this. And so I think it ends up being kind of a pile on in a good way. And I think it's great. I'm of the mind that we should be talking about this with our friends at brunch and with our families at dinner. So I think that to me, the power of this movement comes from the sheer number of vocal spokespeople who are really pushing this out. I was just watching a comedy special by Wanda Sykes and she was making a reference. And so it's not, yes, there are still people who feel a stigma in discussing these sort of things. But I think that that 
has changed a lot in recent years. And I feel like it's very much a snowball effect. You know, it's just getting bigger and bigger because of the amount of attention it's already gotten. And just quickly in relation to my mother's cancer, she was diagnosed with carcinoid tumors, like in the intestines. I mean, not not very common. I think that I benefit, all of us as breast cancer patients and, and I guess researchers benefit from the from the amount of attention on this one disease. That's my explanation. It's the sheer number of voices and the increasing willingness of people to feel like, you know, I'm not the only one here. I'm going to speak up and and I'm going to speak up frequently and repeatedly and not just during breast cancer awareness. You raise an interesting point because if you're not aware of it, it's worth surfacing and dealing with the fact that we do get a little bit of pushback nowadays. There are people who say that there's too much pink or that there's too much attention in October to this one disease and that we should be maybe spreading our attention around more broadly. For me, I would just point out that the mortality, the death rate for breast cancer literally began to fall in 1990 or 91 and has steadily declined every year basically since. And I think, Judy, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe we're way past a 25% improvement in survival over these years. We are. I'm not saying correlation is causation, but many of the things we're doing, I think, are contributing. And this brings me to a question for you. The skeptics on this will say, yeah, but it's treatment has improved. And that's the story. And no doubt treatment has absolutely improved. But making people aware of it and and making sure they access it is the whole point, I think. That said, this is an opportunity to ask you about advances in breast cancer treatment and even support in that regard, and how that has transformed the experience of having breast cancer over your career. And I, and I suspect you've got a long list of possible examples. We both do, Cliff, and I hope that Athena benefited from some of those advances. And when I think about what my mother's experience was, nothing that happened to her happens anymore, which is all because we've had research. And research came because Susan Love and others said we have to invest. So it's true that still there are other cancers that haven't had the kind of attention. Carcinoid is one of them. But for a common cancer, you could say that the benefits have come because we've been able to invest in this tumor. What's changed? Everything. Screening has changed, although I'd say not enough. Mammograms are better than they used to be, but they're never perfect. And there's still many women not having even mammograms. Risk assessment. Now we have genetics. We can try to understand, Athena, why you had two breast cancers in your 30s, although I'm not sure there's an obvious answer to that. But for some reason, some women, we can say in your family, there's a gene that you don't have. You don't have the risk or you do have and you need to have be cared for in a different way. And we have different surgery, much less surgery, no more radical mastectomies with skin grafts and all of these horrible things. Now we have less and less surgery, better plastic and reconstructive surgery. So the surgery itself, I hope, is not as much of a deterrent to women coming forward for their mammograms and other care as before. And systemic therapy is revolutionized. We all used to think of breast cancer as one disease. Breast, pretty simple organ, breast cancer. And now we've learned that the biology of breast cancers are very different and we can target the therapies. And we have all of these different new treatments that are much more effective than before. But as a breast oncologist, and I think as probably as a breast cancer survivor, we're greedy. It's not good enough. We still lose too many women to breast cancer every year, but fewer than we used to. I would just point out also that I think it's wonderful that there we've seen the death, the mortality rate fall, and that we've seen so many advances in treatments. I read the book, Emperor of All Maladies, a few years ago. I think after my second diagnosis, I was obsessed and I learned all about Herceptin and the terribly disfiguring radical mastectomies of the past. And those things are all great. But, you know, I think that it's important to note that even though we've seen so many advancements when it comes to more women surviving, they're not equally shared across the board. And so when it comes to minority women, Black women in particular, which I care a lot about, I'm actually doing a whole documentary project on the idea of Black women who are more likely to get diagnosed younger at more advanced stages, which sounds like a paradoxical, but yeah, there's not a lot of awareness of it. And so I do think that 
that's the next steps. So there's a lot of attention, a lot of research, a lot of studies, but I think there still needs to be a lot of research to figuring out where are the breaking points? Is it just treatment? Is it treatment and people not getting standard of care? Is it lack of access to certain medicines? Like that sort of thing. So we need to find out what's going on with the disparities and also why are Black women more likely to get triple negative breast cancer? And what are going to be the treatments for that rarer form? Critical question. It's interesting. It is certainly over the last couple of years, this aspect of structural racism and its impact has become a focal point for us in medicine, just as it has in other areas of society. And I think it's interesting to point out in that regard and hopeful that if you think about the White House moonshot effort in a very broad strokes, phase one in 2016 was really about technology, putting the seeds in the ground to develop really new treatments and opportunities. But phase two, the one we're in now, is really about practical applications. How do we get advances to everybody? And I think that's exactly what you're touching on. So now I want to ask a question for both of you, which is knowing that we've had this success in a general broad way in terms of awareness, so much so that everybody knows October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. How would we pivot or leverage what has worked to begin to address exactly the problems of disparities that you just described? If you had your genie in the bottle, what is it you would ask for that would actually change things for us? That's really what I'm examining. What is the answer? Because I know that at the beginning of asking this question, I thought, oh, why is it that Black women are more likely? And then I sort of realized, and I should have realized much, much sooner as a Black woman in America, Black people fare worse for so many outcomes. And minorities often fare worse across all kinds of different conditions, not just cancers. And so a lot of it does have to do with the sort of structure of society. And so I guess for me, and this is not meant to be political, but my big question is about access. Like if everyone As I examine, as I sort of research my project, talk to people about this kind of what do we do with this information? What should Black women be doing with this information? I feel like we need more research into every aspect of the problem. Like you said, we've gone big picture, but we need to really, really focus down. And I think that it's going to require everyone to have a similar commitment to doing it. And I, I just sometimes worry that like there's a focus on kind of the larger numbers, the kind of numbers averaged out and not as much of a focus on these disparities. But now that we're talking about the disparities, yes, I think that to me, the main question is access because several of the doctors I've spoken to about this will argue that, look at the VA, women who get treated at the Veterans Affairs, you know, they have equal access and you're not seeing the mortality disparity as much there, or there isn't one at all. But the problem is there isn't equal access. So how do we fix that in a country where there isn't really universal health care? And also I wonder if the outcomes for breast cancer are better in places that are, but I I haven't studied that. So for me, the big question is access and whether that would make a difference. If everyone could have access to the standard of care and be respected by their doctor and be encouraged to do their follow-ups in a timely manner, I think, you know, that would make a difference. Well, first of all, I just want to reassure you that there is a growing body of evidence that supports exactly what you just said. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, and it's not my everyday field, but it's in the VA system in prostate cancer, where there's the exact same parallel disparity, once there is equivalent access to the clinic, stage for stage and histology matched patients have the exact same outcome. And by the way, not only is that unsurprising, I would have been shocked if that was not true. And so your challenge, which is how do we assure equal access to people is really at the core of so much of our work. Another provocative statistic, and I I always get called out for saying this in public only because I can never put my finger on the citation and we like to be evidence-based, but I did it last week at another public forum, is it has been said that if we simply applied current available standard therapies to everybody rather than only some people, we would eliminate about 20% of current cancer mortality in the United States. I'm going to keep scrounging for the model that really proved that so that I can back up the assertion, but I believe it's likely true. And to your point, I still think we're left with the question, where could we put resources, including fundraising and money, 
to actually affect this difference? That's the, the question for us. We can't do everything, but we can do something. Well, we're going to have to do more than something because all the gains we made before we're losing again as people are losing their insurance. And so we know that in this country, that is a huge issue. And there are similar statistics, Cliff, for breast cancer as those you cited for prostate cancer. And, you know, the good news is we have all these great new drugs, but they're very expensive and they're going to have to be made available to everyone equally in order to have the impact that they should. So we have a lot of work to do on the policy side, which has always been much more difficult than, than the science and the clinical research side, but incredibly important and having much broader impact. Well, I have to say, I think that's about as good a place as any to begin to wrap this up. Let me uh, ask each of you, if I could put you on the spot, in a sentence, what would be your biggest takeaway from our conversation today? What is the thing that you would want a listener to take home or, or have stick with them from our conversation? Athena, I'll start with you first. I can be briefer than I've been so far. I think that it's encouraging. I've been encouraged by the conversation. I've been encouraged by my own experience. Obviously, I'm here. It's been 10 year, more than 10 years since my first diagnosis. So I think that anyone listening should feel encouraged that there are all sorts of resources out there. If you or someone you love is affected or dealing with breast cancer or you're worried about the future, just know you're going to be in good hands. There is good care to be had and there is a lot of focus, as we all know, on this disease. And I think it's also encouraging that there is more and more focus on trying to answer this question and face and confront the question of disparities. Well, that will be hard to compete with, but I would share that view. I think breast cancer has been a remarkable story and it has been a place where women have made a difference. The advocacy movements have grown up in breast cancer and the progress has been truly remarkable. But I would say that women should not be afraid to stand up for themselves if they're worried. We hear about that all the time, that people are afraid to advocate for themselves. That should not be the case. This is breast cancer. We're used to it. And that is the way we're going to continue to make progress against a disease that still kills too many people. And we're happy for the progress we make in breast cancer to extend to other cancers as well. So thanks for doing this, Cliff. We're all happy to celebrate the progress in breast cancer. Thank you very much. And with that, I want to thank our listeners for joining us for this podcast, which has been brought to you by Conquer Cancer, the ASCO Foundation. I'll remind you that for doctor-approved patient information, you can visit cancer.net, which is supported in large part by Conquer Cancer donors. Conquer Cancer is creating a world where cancer is prevented or cured and every survivor is healthy. You can make a gift at conquer.org forward slash podcast. The participants of this podcast report no conflicts of interest relevant to the podcast. Full disclosures can be found on the episode page at Conquer.org. The purpose of this podcast is to educate and to inform. This is not a substitute for professional medical care and is not intended for use in the diagnosis or treatment of individual conditions. Guests on this podcast express their own opinions, experience, and conclusions. Guest statements on the podcast do not express the opinions of ASCO. The mention of any product, service, organization, activity, or therapy should not be construed as an ASCO endorsement.